Eric Braverman is the CEO of Schmidt Futures, which is a nonprofit started by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Um, as I understand it, they've committed a uh, billion dollars over time to it. But it, it's, a, it's an interestingly unique, I would say, organization in terms of the scope of its ambitions and the way that it thinks about how to solve problems in the world. So first of all, welcome, Eric. Um, Thank you. And I'd like you to explain what Schmidt Futures is. Sure. David, thank you very much. And you know, thank you to Eric and Wendy Schmidt for making this possible. And to the previous session leader who taught me that awareness is important and that a seated pigeon is to be taken very carefully. Uh, it's wonderful to spend the time with you today. Schmidt Futures, we call ourselves a venture facility for public benefit. And I'll tell you what that means. For us, what that means is that we find and we bet on exceptional people early, people who need opportunity to solve hard problems that matter to society. And then we use a range of tools to help them advance their ideas and create examples that government and business can follow to scale up. We do that over and over again, and here's why. This is a, a moment, I think, of incredible contrast in the world. We have more tools than ever to solve problems, as everyone here in Techonomy knows, because of the power of science and technology. But those problems are harder to solve and more complex than they've ever been. We have people living better lives at higher standards of living all around the world than at any point in human history. And at the same time, we have terrible inequality, growing inequality, we have a pandemic that's affected everyone. We have issues with justice as we've seen, and we have to figure out how to build back better and more equitably. Yeah, that's a heavy set of challenges that you're poised to help us address. Um, the thing that's so interesting to me is the panoply of ways that you think about this issue of bringing talent to bear on solving problems. It ranges from helping kids as young as 15 who are exceptionally talented and promising, all the way to putting together groups that would include ex-CEOs like Ginny Rometty and helping New York State address its problems during the pandemic. Um, so in a way, you're, you're a kind of a broad spectrum philanthropic organization, almost in my mind, like the Ford or Rockefeller foundations in, in terms of the range of things you might consider getting involved in. But the way you get involved in all of them has to do with thinking about the people first who would be the change makers in effect, right? I mean, I, I don't know whether I'm getting off track with that because I'm- That's exactly right. Okay, well, we, thank you. And, we start I, with talent because, yeah. you know, we know the technology and capital, which so many people here talk about, are essential for solving problems in the world. But technology and capital by themselves don't solve problems, people do. And the name of the game, if you wanna move people with resources and government and business is to get talent to the table, but the market for talent is broken. And that is why it is so important when you're in a position like ours, where the money in the world is not in philanthropy to change the world, it's in government and business. So if you want to get talent to the table to solve problems, you have to take a focus on them. And I'm, I'm happy to give you some examples if that would yeah, be. Yeah, please give us some examples. Thank you. Sure. So, I mean, just last week, you know, Governor Cuomo in New York signed a law that created a first in the nation commitment to universal affordable broadband, calling broadband like food or water to success in the modern life. And that didn't happen by accident. That happened because a commission was formed that brought in, as you said, people, CEOs from academia, from philanthropy, from business, all across fields, working in interdisciplinary ways. It brought in experts from technology and policy that worked as staff, both through Schmidt Futures, the government and others. It also involved deep public engagement, bringing ideas from more than 10,000 New Yorkers together. And that was just the beginning. So bringing people together across fields and beating the heck out of ideas to challenge them and compete them to make it into the final report. The group had more than 50 meetings in less than a year. From there, we said, how are we gonna apply science and technology thoughtfully? How do we move things online that has been difficult for the state? And how do we bring multiple types of capital to bear? Not just philanthropic gifts and grants, but creating public-private partnerships, 
moving corporate action through something, for example, called the Pathways Pledge. And at the end, we had this first in the nation commitment that affects 7 million New Yorkers who now will get service at affordable rates they couldn't get before. 50,000 students won't have to pay anything because it's supported philanthropically for them to get devices and service. We have grants in telehealth for rural and underserved communities, and we're able to get small businesses online. All of that happens because it starts with where are we gonna find the talent for new ideas? How do we bring them in the places they weren't before together to sort of move this much broader system and that system change is required. So whose idea was it in the first place to assemble that group to address those challenges? Yeah, the commission was formed by the governor of New York and Eric Schmidt, our co-founder was the chairman of the commission. The commission was then run by Schmidt Futures and New York State. And together we assembled the entire group, which of course is both the commissioners themselves, but also New Yorkers and the staff that we brought in and experts that we consulted throughout the way. You know, this is an example of what it takes when you're trying to solve a hard problem now. If you can bring the talent to the table, get them working in interdisciplinary ways, they can do things you couldn't do before. But the right. thing is you can't only solve problems now. You also, if you care about the problems in the future, have to overcome the market failures, which causes those problems in the first place. This is why you referenced the billion dollar commitment that our co-founders Eric and Wendy had made. This is why we're also focused on thinking about what are the long-term barriers to talent. You know, We see that all around the world, there are exceptional people that don't get supported that, because they just simply don't look like people that have been supported before. They're not part of a system designed to find them. And that happens from a really young age and it compounds over time. And so we asked the question, well, what if you found some of these exceptional people and you supported them for life? What if you brought them together in a community that could last for decades? You could do not only the largest longitudinal study of talent in the world, but frankly, you could bring together exceptional people for decades to come up with ideas. And that's because their ideas are likely to be smarter than ours. Right, and you're and talking about humility. your RISE program, which some have sort of thought of as a MacArthur grant for teenagers. Talk about what it is and, 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 and be, be specific. Let's get a full detail of this RISE program because it's quite extraordinary. Absolutely, be delighted to tell you about it. RISE is a program that we have created in partnership with the Rhodes Trust. And RISE is designed to find exceptional 15 to 17 year olds all around the world who need opportunity who are brilliant and compassionate and can persevere and have compassion. And the idea is to say, what if they form part of a community that we could support for life? So what we're doing is we had 50,000 people just in the first year from more than 160 countries who came together from towns, from villages, from cities. They applied to the program. They participated in a variety of service projects just to be part of the application process. We're in the process now of down selecting them to a group of finalists that will support in a variety of ways. Everyone who participates has access to online courses that are provided to them for free if they're able to access them. Mm -hmm. And then at the end for this year, we'll select 100 global winners. We are going to bring them together in a residential program, pandemic permitting, for a number of weeks to allow them to exchange with each other and to participate in educational opportunities. We'll provide them with a need-based scholarship to college. We'll then create a career services and mentoring network for them to persist for life. We'll invite others that wanna provide opportunities to share it with them, whether they're created for us or not, because the program's not about us, it's about them and their ideas. And then we've also set aside investment capital that we can use on a charitable basis to support them in nonprofits they wanna start in their life to support their ideas, as well as to create companies with a social purpose and they'll have to participate in those opportunities competitively. But the idea is that it's just not enough if what you care about is to bring fine, smart people, you know, they're not just teenagers, they're teenagers who grow up. It's not just enough to support them once. You have to lower the barriers for them to help others. And the only way to do that is to stay with them. And that's what we're aiming to do through RISE. It's, it's really investing at the very beginning of the kind of world changing food chain, I guess. Uh, so, so these are not people who have to come to you with an idea for changing the world. They're people who you identify as the kind of people who would likely have major world changing ideas in the future, who if they have had the proper education and support will have the best chance 
at making those things a reality. Is that a fair restatement of it? That's right. Now, I want to be clear that we're not opposed to supporting people who have ideas right now for changing. Sure, them. of course. You know, just this year, Eric and Wendy supported an incredible center at the Broad called the Schmidt Center, which is focused on helping seed a new field of programmable biology in order to create a wide range of applications that could be in healthcare and otherwise. And in that work, they're supporting networks of talent all around the world to use programmable biology to help people. That's an example of how you can invest in people right now that have ideas. But at of the course. same time, if we wanna keep having those people, we have to invest in them early. And the reality is that I don't know that many 15 year olds that know exactly what they wanna do with their lives. But if you can lower the barriers for them to think I've had an idea and now I'm ready to bring it to the world, we're much more likely to get them as part of this system, which is so fundamental if what we're trying to do is to have new ideas that government or business can ultimately pay for to make all of our lives better. Yeah, and I, I love the contrast with Peter Thiel who paid kids to drop out of college. Uh, you're finding really talented kids and really helping them go to college. That makes a little more sense to me. Um, we have somebody who's in our system classified as an anonymous attendee asking a good question, which I will just throw at you. What are the biggest impediments to developing talent in the US? And what do you think are the most impactful ways we can do it, you kind of societally. Sure, there are a lot of impediments actually, and it, it's really important in this work to be humble for a number of reasons. One of them is that, you know, you have to remember that when you're working on these problems of trying to elevate people who can use science and technology to make the world better, you know, the money isn't with you. It's with groups like government and business, but government has trouble taking bets on people because of politics, but also frankly, basic R&D spending by the government is half in 2020 of what it was in 1964. So if we're serious about that, we're gonna to have to invest more. In addition, if you look at the money that goes, for example, to gifted and talented programs, it is 0.0002% of the money in the federal education budget. And that's before we even start talking about racial and other disparities. So again, part of the issue here is that the money to support the people that we're talking about from backgrounds all around the world, and certainly in this country, from rich and poor, trying to rectify these disparities that we see, we're gonna to have to move a much broader system. Another challenge is that the town isn't always at the table, we can't always find them. Even with RISE, for example, we've used an online platform to encourage people to apply, but we also have a pathway on WhatsApp and we have a pathway on paper because you have to meet people that don't have access to many of the things that we all take for granted, all of us that today are here in this conference on Zoom. So it's really hard to find people and the system compounds upon itself because the same disparities that keep people from having opportunities later in life actually start much earlier. So I think that's another incredible challenge. Yeah, there's several dif different things that kind of I think characterize the nature of your work across all the different things you do, which are quite diverse. Um, one is you really believe in multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity um, and as your work with academics to bring people from different disciplines together. And I assume that one you mentioned before is an example of that. And you've done it, I think, in a number of, of cases. You very much believe in creating networks of talent uh, and you also are trying, and this is something that came up with Dambisa Moyo earlier this afternoon in our discussions, to take a very systemic view in a way that it hasn't been taken in, in most cases in the past. Feel free to pick up on any of those and tell us a little more about why you're looking at the world in those ways. Sure, I mean, look, we, we're trying to do a couple of things. We're trying to get the talent to the table because the market failure is that the people that are there with the best ideas aren't always there. We're trying to organize that talent to solve hard problems. And we're focused in particular on increasing knowledge in society and increasing shared success. And that involves rectifying a number of the disparities and others that we talked about. And then even when those ideas are in place, we have to help them scale. So while we apply it in different ways, you know, our approach is really about a method in a certain way. And I think you called out some of the most critical ones. One of them is this idea that a network of people is more powerful than an individual. I'm not sure it's ever been true that a single person by themselves changed the world, but it's certainly not true now. 
it's teams and networks of people that change the world. And so we're looking to bring them together across fields. We also think that it's worthwhile to challenge the heck out of things. So we use a variety of competitive mechanisms to try to bring ideas and, and to make them better. We think that's a sign of respect in order to help people much, you know, in a much more productive way. We also apply science and technology. We believe that science and technology will have a mostly positive effect on society if it's managed properly. And that one of the things that creates a real enabler for us to help the world at scale are these new tools. So we need to invest in them and give society the tools to have the conversations needed about what's appropriate. And finally, I think that we also really do care about bringing multiple types of capital to bear. You know, the, the world has converged, the public, the private, the nonprofit sectors, you know, they perform often similar functions. If you look at even the education system, the healthcare system, you know, in, in countries all around the world, every sector is required to solve social problems, not just one. So that's really what we're focused on. You know, uh, go ahead, David. No, no, well, that's, you, you're teeing up what I was expecting might be my last big question. And that is, uh, you're a nonprofit, but I know you believe that it's really government and business that are where the real leverage lies if they can be assisted in taking the risks they need to take to really get things done and that you're very much looking for partners in your work. So I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, but I, I, I know you said something really good to me. I wanted you to re repeat it about what was holding back governments and businesses from taking some of these risks. Yeah, I mean, government struggles because the politics rarely encourage people to be the first to take the bet on something. And for business, the returns are just not quick enough or large enough early. But that's why this kind of patient capital is required to create examples. You know, here's, here's another example. A wonderful uh, group called Upsolve was founded by Rohan Pavaluri. We were first check. They were now listed as one of time's best inventions for relieving $250 million of debt in a time of great need for Americans. Here's another example. We sponsored a, a competition called the Alliance for the American Dream in Arizona, Ohio, Utah, and Wisconsin in partnership with the state universities there. They catalyzed an entire ecosystem of business, government, academic leaders in each community to answer the question of what would it take to raise net incomes in their community by 10% for 10,000 families within three years through any number of, of strategies. One of them chose the strategy of using an AI chatbot to help people apply for more federal student aid. And they were able to maintain their levels of participation in that student aid applications, which is mandatory federal spending at a time that other states didn't. And what that meant was like more than $100 million of, of benefits to the people in that state. So real things happen because people in academia were working with local partners in business who didn't have the original idea, but they were able to help with the AI chatbot development in order to work with the people in the university to apply for funds for the government. And now we have people whose net incomes are higher in the state of Arizona. And that's something that we're very proud of. Well, you're being applauded for, for talking so much about collaboration in the Q&A. And, and someone else is asking specifically about how you work with businesses. Um, Oh, oh, government. Well, 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 this person asked both about governments and corporations, but corporations, I think that would be one you haven't fully elaborated on much. I, I know that the, the idea, as we, you touched on before, is that you have the capital and the patience to prove out things that government or business might not have the patience or the capital or the risk tolerance to do themselves. But can you talk a little bit about what you have done and can do with corporations and be specific about what kind of partners you're looking for as we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, the, the New York Commission I mentioned is a good example. You know, more than 16 corporations signed up to something called the Pathways Pledge, which creates retraining and other opportunities for people to enter the digital economy. This is a case where we set out a broad goal about how to help New York build back better and companies by their own volunteering, joined and made a pledge in order to help create opportunities for other people. That's just one example. Another example is that as you invest in scientific and technological applications, it can be an opportunity for business to develop them. Not all of the labs that we invest in 
are in universities. In some cases, they're in labs that are in corporate forms. And those corporate forms actually really make a difference in advancing the kind of innovation that will help people at scale. So, you know, it can take a number of forms. Businesses can serve as partners for the work we do. Businesses can serve as homes for the type of research that fundamentally is essential for this. They can serve as advocates for more effective policy. Advocating for universal connectivity requires businesses to participate. And so these are all just examples of different ways that businesses can come in. I'll make a final plug, which is that in programs that we're doing like RISE, like otherwise, it will only work to bring talent to the table if there are opportunities for talent to serve. And that will require all, all of us. It requires government to bring the best talent into government here and around the world. It will require business to think about how can I help these incredibly motivated people, not only to serve the goals of our corporation, but also to help think about the impact the corporation has in the world. And what opportunities can we have to draw people in to do that work through our vehicles? So we're looking for people to help us with that, to form that market for talent. And specifically that means to help find people that can't be found and to give opportunities for them to succeed in ways that help others. Well, congrats on your extremely innovative project that you're, you're spearheading. And thank you for joining us and explaining it. And uh, let's stay in close touch. Great to have you here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eric.